Good morning. So welcome to the Board of Commissioners work session on August 25th, 2015, 9 o'clock here in the Jackson Room. The first item on our agenda today is a discussion of water issues in general. So what we will be uh, discussing, and including but not limited to, uh, dams, conservation, uh, conservation, Oregon Place based planning in the Rogue Valley. Commissioner Roberts and uh, John Roberts from Southwest Oregon, uh, representative and the chair of the Oregon Water Resource Committee. So Commissioner Roberts is bringing the uh, item to the agenda today, and Commissioner John Roberts from the Oregon Water Resource uh, Commission is here today also. We we'll want to recognize Commissioner Roberts for being here. I would like to ask uh, John, uh, Commissioner if you would come to the table also, and uh, Larry, come here, sure. if you would, please. Larry is our regional water resource for the state, water master. Well, actually, I'm a regional manager. John Skelly is your local water master for Jackson County. Have, what I'd like to do well, first. Before we get started, okay. uh, I just want to invite you to the table, and this is Commissioner Roberts' discussion. I think she wants to talk about some other issues okay. before we get into the other. Okay, good. Okay, well, okay, good. If you want I to get out, I'm not sure I gave one to the Commissioner Breedenthal and the other commissioners, and uh, okay. do not have one. I think it's good reference material. So I, I do thank you kindly. Been five weeks waiting for this meeting, and my my request was to talk about the dam removals, and um, if I'm concerned about them. I know there's more on, on our horizon, and uh, my constituents are concerned about the dam removals, and I didn't want to just turn a blind eye to what's going on. And so I know uh, Commissioner Brian Thaw had asked John Roberts, and I will defer to the experts if you want to do your presentation, and then I will follow up with, with my comments on the dams. Okay. Well, this is a this is your moment if you're having one. Well, was it, did you want to talk about water in general? I'm I, not sure what. I will, whenever you're ready. It doesn't matter. Okay. Well, I, uh, thank you for inviting me today. Um, this stems from a meeting that I had with uh, Commissioner Bridenthal about uh, just getting up to date on the integrated water resource strategy and place-based planning opportunity uh, that we have. Uh, I wanted to get started by getting everybody on the same page here. Uh, many of you in the room have no doubt seen the, uh, the Oregon Basin Outlook Report. The last one I have uh, shows that uh, our snowpack this year was the lowest on record for 35 years, about 6 7% of normal, something on that order. So we're, we're Larry and uh, Travis can, can give you more details there. I also would pass around the table uh, this uh, drought report. Which, uh, again, no surprises, but it shows you what is out there, what we're dealing with right now in the water world. Uh, excuse me, I that. Um, but it, it, it just shows you that we have an ongoing problem here. And, uh, Water Resources Department and the Commission are one of the best to, to, uh, to deal with something that we, we don't have much of. And then uh, quickly, uh, you know, I, I ran the what we call the teacup report that uh, you're perhaps you're familiar with, that, that's showing that uh, Travis deals with this every day. You know, Howard Perry is down around 20% full. Howard Perry, Kaya is 14% full. Immigrant 30. Uh, you say you're going to be out of water in Fish Lake here in the next week, whatever. I, I, yeah, I think that's uh, somewhere near 14% like percent full, something on that order. So net nap, there's not going to be much left uh, to carry over uh, for next year. The next, uh, so that's with that background, I, I wanted to uh, direct your attention now to the uh, integrated water resource strategy, uh, which uh, the Water Resources Department and the Water Resources Commission started preparing after the legislature's uh, uh, authorization in 2009. It was adopted in, in 2012. And the Water Resources Department was the lead agency in preparing this document, along with the DBQ, Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Ag, and several other the natural resource departments. 
in addition, uh, public input was gathered uh, around the state. We had uh, meetings here in Medford uh, to take uh, input and comment on it. We had an 18-member advisory board from people around the state in all areas of, of the water world, uh, of stakeholders to help uh, achieve a diverse range of perspectives and to speak on, on behalf of uh, all Oregonians. Uh, this document was approved by the Water Resource Commission in August uh, 2nd of 2012, and uh, the, the, the vision is to develop a statewide integrated water resource strategy, which we Oregon does not have, uh, that will bring various sectors of interest together uh, to work for a common purpose of maintaining healthy water resources to meet the needs of the Oregonians. So, with that, um, if you, when you look through this uh, book, you'll find that there are four primary objectives. And the chapter in, in this integrated water resource strategy is the order of each one. The first one is to understand Oregon's water resources today. The second is to understand in-stream and out-of-stream needs. The third is to understand the coming pressures that affect our needs and supplies. And then the fourth is to meet or even in-stream and out-of-stream needs. And within these four objectives, 15 critical issues were identified with 42 recommended actions. And the legislature has requested that this document be updated every five years, so the next iteration will be in 2017. Uh, and we will take advantage of lessons learned during this, this first implementation to uh, continue the development of this document. So it's, it's a dynamic one, and we will continue to uh, work and improve it. My discussion today is on uh, recommended actions 9A and 9B, which is to undertake place-based integrated water resource planning and to coordinate the implementation of the existing natural resource plans. And you'll find this on page 80 to 82 in this document. In 2015, the legislature passed uh, Senate Bill 266, which provides 750000 in bond funding for communities or other organizations to conduct place-based planning. And this is uh, an effort that you realize that each basin in the state is unique and that we, we want local uh, people to do the planning for their water requirements and not just trying to do it at the state level. So the legislature uh, provided some funding for this effort, uh, $750,000, and we think that that will uh, cover three pilot projects uh, around the state, three different basins, where we can kind of get started on this process. And as we're fortunate in that we recently, the Four watershed councils came together here, uh, Fair Creek, the Middle Road, Cota Butte, and Upper Road to, to form the, the uh, Road River Watershed Council. That in turn is part of a bigger group that covers from Gold Beach on up through Fair Creek Basin, up through uh, Little Butte, and then the Upper Road called the Road Basin Partnership. And they are, are studying this and working on getting everything together so they can apply for one of these grants. And the uh, commission will probably finalize the rulemaking on these grants and the, the criteria in November at our meeting. And then uh, the grants will be accepted and probably uh, uh, approved in February, March, somewhere in that period. So what I'm asking for today is First, uh, you take a look at this, see if the, uh, the county commissioners can su would be supportive of this effort to do place-based planning in the road basin. It would, it would start at Gold Beach and would work its way all the way through uh, the whole river system here. So I think uh, your endorsement would be highly beneficial. Uh, we, I've talked to Simon Hare over in Josephine County, and, and he is a very 
much in agreement with the effort. And the soil water conservation and districts from here to the coast are all in favor and supporting. Also, uh, the DEQ and so forth. So, uh, with that, I, I try and answer any questions you have. Can you define place-based? You know, place-based planning means that instead of a big broad brush, that we, we look at the, the unique situation and features uh, of a particular basin. Because we're a lot different than, say, uh, the uh, Columbia River Basin uh, as far as uh, our, our capacity to store water or the you know, <coughs> different. different. And so, it, it's an effort to narrow down the focus to a particular basin. Because there are basin plans that are now uh, done back in the 70s for roadhead one, probably half the basins in Oregon had an original plan. And now, uh, of course, those are need to be updated. They haven't been since the 70s. So it's, it's time to deal with the, the, the cards we've got. Now. Because what I understood when I was researching integrated water strategies, it originated from a UN agenda water plan, a strategy from globally. And how do you integrate that with place-based? Well, uh, place-based planning is part of the integrated water resource strategy for the state. It's a component of it in order to optimize our use of water. We need to get down to a, a lower level. Just the integrated water resource strategy for the state is, is kind of a high level uh, look at everything. It identifies the issues, it identifies the, the focus for the, the, the ongoing project. And then within that are these uh, 41 or two action items of which place based planning represents two of those. So the water resources department with the commission and the legislature support has been working on you know, taking these 40 action items and taking, working on them as opportunities committed. So they probably are working on it, at least 20 of them right now. So it doesn't all come together nice and neatly. It kind of rolls through. So at this point, with the legislature's support, we're, we're ready to start on place-based planning. Just because I haven't um, those that are in opposition, are some, can you tell me what specific issues somebody might have that would be in opposition to place based planning? Or, uh, I haven't uh, really heard anything other than uh, some people may be opposed to the, the, the grant money, uh, so it's, it's maybe some economic, but I, I'm, I think the commission and the department are pretty well in the legislature or would not have passed all this if they weren't convinced that the economic benefits far outweigh uh, you know, the, the cost here. Because you know we're dealing with a situation that, that these people can tell you more than I you know, that you know, we don't have any carryover water. You know, we, we've got to figure out how we can optimize everything we've got. Now maybe you want to elaborate on how the planning aspect of the starting blocks to uh, achieve the projects, the finance projects that the stakeholders are involved in the planning process. Uh, well, but identify that yeah, the, 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 up for other grant money. The, there, there's, along with the, the place-based planning grant that the legislature authorized, um, there, there's a couple of other uh, um, Watery bond opportunities, and one of them uh, is the so-called uh, 1069 feasibility studies, and uh, that has been in effect for probably 15 years. Uh, the, the legislature comes back and reloads it every so often, and this this time they put in two million dollars uh, to provide a feasibility study uh, grants and loans. So that communities or other entities around the state can take advantage of, 
uh, loans probably typically totaling fifty to two hundred thousand dollars to uh, look at their own uh, water reuse, storage, uh, conservation opportunities. <coughs> so there's a, another uh, area that, that I think it would be wise for Jackson County to take a look at when opportunities come in. And then there's, a, a, in addition, there's another uh, fund out there called the Senate Bill 839 Water Supply Development Account. And the legislature added the $6.25 million in lottery bonds available in 2017 to uh, fund these water supply development projects. And that's in addition to about seven and three quarter million that is currently in that account and available right now. So I, I guess my point is that there's a lot of opportunity uh, should we can find various projects that we need to take a look at from the ground up without committing to the, the building or whatever. But just the, fees, the basic feasibility opportunities doesn't make sense to do this project. Commissioner, would it be fair to say, if we study this and sort of wrap our minds around it, there about what's happening in the state of Illinois, to say that this is a good out this place based planning is a good way of saying local regional approach, taking inventory of what we have here on a regional basis, what is what is current, what is outdated, what needs to be updated, and right. then develop those mm -hmm. plans and then look for uh, opportunities of potential new off-channel storage facilities. Absolutely. And find ways to be able to build those facilities for uh, more storage capacity in the future. Could you sort of elaborate on that if possible, or Larry, or whoever? Okay, so you look at that as a local plan. Yeah, I'll make a stab at it. Um, with all these funds that have been um, given to our agency and in charge of all this, like direct control, and our mission is to, as opposed to having multiple projects out there that may fly and may not, and the issue of you know, feasibility monies and study monies, is to pick a project that's going to be successful and then use these fundings to do the feasibility study, um, do the planning of, of the facility, and then actually there's money available to actually build these kinds of projects. So in the past, we've given lots of money out, but not a lot of results after the first phase. So now, we've been charged with all these additional monies to bring these programs abroad. And, and you're absolutely right. Off-channel storage is a key component of what we're looking at. But when you talk about storage, you start talking about individual interest. These storage facilities that we are hoping that we can help fund around the state in local basins we can cover a broad arena of uses. So when we build storage facilities, not all for A. They have, may have an A component, they may have a recreational component, and it may have fish and wildlife components. So where do we place these things We get the biggest bang for the buck? And, and of course, they have to be off-channel in today's area. We just can't build reservoirs in channel anymore with all the environmental impacts that, that are created by that. So we're looking for some facilities where we can divert water into these and not impact the system. Would those off-channel storage facilities have opportunity for hydroelectric Absolutely. and being able to produce power to make the, the, the local communities? Yes. Sort of going back to the Especially with the technology that they have now. Yeah. I think in-stream hydro is a, is a very realistic now where you can put small hydropower plants in up to where opportunities can live, such as perhaps branch on block or something like that. Um, the, the, the other thing that, uh, that, that has been completed now, that there was a, a lot of study done on what we call peak seasonal flows. How much water can you divert from the, the stream or river during the high flow season? without affecting the uh, environment and the fish and, and so forth. So those have been determined uh, as a percent of flow so that we can now take that water and move it into off-stream storage if there is a site and then take advantage of it later in the year. So all the pieces are coming together now to support 
better utilization of the water. And as John mentioned, if you go to the original River Basin Plan, which is outdated to the but it had a list of potential storage facilities. Now at that time, those were in check. Uh, an example would be that was good drainage. They wanted to build a, a reservoir at the top of that drainage to help augment flows like you do with Lost Creek and Applebee. Well, those are kind of off the table now because environmentally, you can't build those kind of facilities. You just can't get the support. Sort of have to look what else yeah, you know, Well, yeah. I was going to say, I hate to bring Elk Creek up because that's a, you know, that it works, but yes, that's what ends up happening. But is there somewhere there we could build a facility and pick up these peak flows as he's talking about, store that water, and then utilize it for all the needs necessary? Right now in the drought, Evans Creek is producing less than a half a CFS. It's virtually mud puddles right now. Okay, and we have quite a bit of ag there. We've got water rights to go back to 1881 on that system, and they're the only ones pumping, and they aren't able to. This is a pretty severe drought that we've been in. Fairly unique in the 25 years of having the old water. We've always had some form of snowback. And so the recharge, the slow recharge is just not happening. The stream is alive. So when they land, it's going to So to circle back on what John was mentioning, the intent of the place based bank is to bring all the stakeholders to the table to identify the issues that are in their mind and have that spectrum of global input to identify the potential sites of, of moving forward to address our water supply needs. And so once the plan has been created, then it allows you to leverage that global support and the state dollars to study the feasibility of the project and then hopefully construct a set of project. So that's kind of like the bullet points that you were to boil the all the the wonderful acronyms of integrated water resource strategy and all the other Senate bills now. And, and we have one big project already here in this county, and that's why that fits in these we categories. And, you know, and obviously the county has been supporting that for quite some time. Um, and it's further along than most. And, and so I'm sure they'll already have taken advantage of the first Senate Bill 266. I think we gave them $250,000 to help them with their feasibility studies. So, you know, it's those kinds of projects that potentially have success for a wide range of activities as opposed to narrowing it down. The, this World Basin Partnership that was formed beginning January 1st this year, I think really uh, is what is the missing link pulling everybody together because it's a, a diverse group all with interests in, in water and water resources, environmental, agriculture, and so forth that, that I think has the potential right, and that, that can, with assistance from others outside uh, to pull off uh, you know, a successful place-based planning effort. Because you would have somebody you know, they're managing you know, full-time, near full-time, and uh, pull all the pieces together. And I think that, in my opinion at least, is what's been lacking down here. Is we've got a lot of well-meaning, hard-working organizations, but they're not, they didn't until now come together to kind of share ideas and, and get a focus here to, to make this uh, work. So. Yeah, this is probably a little late. This maybe how you normally might do it, but I think it might be. I know Doug knows a little bit about your background here in the Valley. I, I know about some of the people. I don't think Mr. Dyer and Mr. Roberts know that much about you. Okay. And also, maybe you could explain your role working with the commission that you're not a state employee, but you're a local citizen. Talk about your history in the Valley, mm -hmm. the reason you know, the work you've done in the Valley that okay. isn't related to anything to do with government. And those types of things that may be important to know your perspective. Okay, well, at the risk of boring it. Uh, yeah, I uh, came here in late 1969. I grew up in Crown Falls on a ranch over there. And uh, I then uh, went to Oregon State, majored in food science and technology, uh, was in ROTC, went in the Air Force, and uh, flew B 52s for five years in, in Vietnam and around. 
and uh, when I got out in uh, late 69, uh, the job I chose was at Perry and David. So I started as a food processing manager, eventually ended up as a senior vice president there. Uh, retired after 33 years in 2008. And uh, <coughs> that July, uh, from the governor saying, would I be interested in uh, representing the Water Resource Commission in Southwest Oregon? And uh, one thing led to another. Uh, about three years ago now, I was asked by the governor to chair the commission. So that's my, my brief history here. But, but you sell yourself short a little bit of period of You ran the agricultural operations piece for how long? So you understand how important the water uh, I was I've been in involved in the ag side of Perry and David and, and, and actually responsible for the worldwide fruit sourcing for all the gift back. And, and you live here? And I live in Jackson. And you're a citizen of all of yeah, yeah, yeah. No uh, elected government experience. I just got caught up in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to know, on um, um, Oregon, the integrated resource strategy and the place-based planning, how means we're going to talk about dam removals. How do what how do you interact with the dam removal situation in Jackson County? And my other question is um, on you're looking to build water infrastructure, not necessarily protect infrastructure. Does that gonna possibly be involved with them that domain issues? You know, I can't answer that, that second question. Okay. If I'm in the domain. I, we don't get down in the weeds that far. Um, but what, what I'm looking at, the, the commission is looking at in, in the Water Resources Department, is opportunities that make sense to improve our water supply uh, without affecting the ecosystem and, and other areas that, uh, that we, we want to continue to improve also. So we, we've got to look at uh, what is affecting use of the money to create storage opportunities off screen uh, and uh, we, we you know we've got some dams in uh, Jackson County particularly that are, that are outdated they would be perhaps were useful at one point for irrigation or impoundment but they're, they're barriers and they're not collecting water significantly now and they, they really uh, you know if you look at Savage Rapids it created a nice lake for people living right along there, but it was a beach barrier with fish passage and uh, you know, the natural flow of the river. So um, when we, we mitigated the removal of that dam with pumps to uh, enable the, the people with water rights to continue to get water. Um, you know, but it, it's an effort to, to modernize, update our infrastructure, uh, and no doubt that, that will affect some people who enjoy a, you know, a nice water view perhaps. Now they'll have a stream. But the, the, the economic value of those impoundments um, has ceased to, to be. Maybe I can add something to it too. First of all, Water Resources Department wasn't the instigator facilities, it was a combination of multi-agencies, multi-environmental uh, groups. But what you need to understand about those facilities that have been removed, there's only one facility that's been removed or never completed, is a better word, and that's Elk Creek that had storage. These facilities that you're talking about that have been removed along the river never had a storage component. They were conversion dams. They were built to divert water either for power and energy and irrigation. They had no legal right to store water, and they weren't designed to store water. And if you really look at the big picture, they were silted into where the storage capacity was nothing. All they did was back up water. Okay? And so they had a more negative impact to the river system than removing something like Elk Creek that was going to store 250,000 acre feet of water or 60,000 acre feet. You know, right now Lost Creek Reservoir stores 360,000 acre feet of water. That's a lot of water that's carried this river through this drought. We've dipped into 
the carryover to maintain flow for fish, for recreation, all of the above. Those dams would, don't provide water. They were blockages to hold water back and divert into a canal or a power system. So when we say removing storage facilities, those were not storage facilities. Unfortunately, the only one we know of that would have stored additional water would have been a and that kind of was a unilateral yes. action by the Army Corps of Engineers. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Which our board, <coughs> which our board uh, objected. objected. Yes. Yeah, and again, that was a federal mandate that came down. But let me just correct something. Sure. It actually wasn't a federal mandate, it was a administrative move by the Army Corps of Engineers who received budget authority to provide fish passage, which was done by trucking fish around the dam. It was done by a budget move through the appropriation at the federal level, and the Army Corps unilaterally decided that they had authority because the funding was authorized to notch the dam. And they did it without Congress's approval of the actual activity. They did it with Congress's approval of the funding. So no, no, I thought it was, I actually thought it was court. I thought they fought it all the way in. And yeah, the ruling was that they were able to take up the dam. Nevertheless, my example was just the fact that that was the only storage facility out of all these renewals that we were talking about. That was actually storage, yeah, that was storage. And power potential. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate the, the opportunity to meet with you, and uh, when the time comes, and we continue to, if, if the group continues to pursue this grant, uh, we'll, we'll come and, and talk again and, and see if you're ready to support it. Because I think your your support behind the place-based planning grant and request would mean a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. And if you would, you know, anyone has some questions, and we'll the next half of us. Sure, we'll stick around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Um, we'll stick around for a while. I appreciate that. And I'm really interested in the, the off channel uh, storage potential. The creation of new storage, more water storage, for hydroelectric, uh, renewable, real renewable energy. It is a, an exciting opportunity for the dam here in Square You know, I think that's one of the things that this place based planning will identify. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I had asked for a discussion on the dam removals. Um, and since I made my request to that were removed, that um, the expert said the storage capacity was nothing, that's Fielder Dam and Weimer Dam. And um, just briefly, I wanted to discuss uh, a couple weeks ago, I had written a letter to the governor personally to find out how our dam removals fit with the emergency drought declaration in our county. And um, Commissioner Bridenfell explained that several people had uh, addressed, had called, uh, including Senator Bert Sugar and the governor's staff, regarding my letter. And I, um, I thought about that after I left the meeting and I was confused about Senator, the senator's call. And I called him and he said, no. I said, did we call you? Did the governor's office call you about my letter? They had, he didn't know about my letter. He had called because I, a citizen had called him, he said, at the 11th hour to be at the discussion at the dam, and it wasn't related to that. And I just wanted that clarified for the record that my letter did quite impose a lot of county resources that had been suggested at that meeting. And for clarification, I don't think I referenced as if they called me regarding the dam removal. I didn't know if the letter was. Oh, well, the discussion topic was, was about my letter, so I just put it together with that. It was, it was yeah, involving my letter. In fact, the whole discussion got to, to be how uh, we need to act united. And um, I and I was elected to come and act united. If we need to be united, we just need one commissioner. I'm here to represent the people, the interests of the constituents, who many had called me um, in concern about the many dam removals. So moving on, um, I have done a lot of independent research and I have prepared you each a folder of my and what's the county 
of my information that I have looked at. It starts, here is at Weimer Dam. I've got pictures. And I have a whole packet of extra copies for your citizen who wants a copy. They, I copied everything. I have given to the commissioners you can have after the meeting. Um, this is the Weimer Dam before, and this is the Weimer Dam after. And, and no, it is, it's not going to have any capacity to store water now. It, uh, in my opinion, it did before it was not. It was before it was removed. But um, so I start out. You did get a copy of my letter to the governor on there that I wrote independently to, because I feel I have a duty and responsibility as a commissioner to know if there is a, a drought declaration. How does that impact what we're doing in Jackson County? And I didn't know if the dam removals were were um, in opposition of that. It's like. To me, it was like declaring bankruptcy and going on a shopping spree. <laughs> you know, we have a serious uh, issue with water storage, as the experts identified, and these were somewhat water storage. And uh, then page two of your packet has a response from the um, governor's representative who called me, and that was Lori Onan, who kind of laid out the conversation we had and sent it to our administrator, and I appreciate um, Mr. Jordan sending it to all of us. And she sent it to several other people who, either from the water water board and I don't know who everybody is on here, DEQ, and maybe other governor uh, representatives. But um, she stated, and page three has a copy of my recollection of the phone call, which is real similar, similar to hers. She said these two dams, Weimer and Fielder, were abandoned and not used for irrigation, having no effect on our drought. And if you go to page four, there's the pictures from the Weimer Dam. There is, is an infrastructure set up for irrigation at the little ranch there just above where the dam was. And of course, it's not reaching water now. It is sucking air. But it was being used for irrigation. And I can see how maybe someone from Salem couldn't see that. Page five also has a picture of the, I went on site, <laughs> has a picture of the, the final product of the, bear, the, the trickle of a stream. And up in the top corner has that um, irrigation um, equipment that was set up in place. And so, um, so it has those dams that were removed have no impact on our drought um, from our experts and from the governor's office. So it's I've heard it's all about the fish then. And so if it's the fish ladders that were ineffective, and that's why they're removing the dams, and I'm just trying to figure out what is behind it. And I have gathered, we used to have a fish counting station at Gold Ray, and I got the data from 1947 to 2010 when that fish station was removed. And it is just kind of like climate change, you know? There's years it's big, it's years it's down, but the fish were never extinct over the decades of, um, of the dams and how they were used in our county. And of course now, there is no fish counting capabilities. There will be no accountability. There's not going to be a record to see if the fish has been improved from the passage of these dam dams removed. And so, you know, I'm not sure how, how they are, who is going to show what they did was indeed uh, accomplishing what they said. And if it is about fish passage, page seven, has the pools of just turbidity that were left at Weimer Dam. And when I was up there, I mean, there was little bubbles of wildlife trying to seek life there, but there, there's not going to be um, fish that are traveling through this, this area for a while till we get some good rainfall. And they were right, it's just puddles is all that's, that's left in these upstream um, water components. And there is a ranch, this ranch is on page seven, it's just above where that irrigation um, piece was. And you know, we we who live out in the country, that's how you fight a fire. If you, if you have a structure fire or you have a fire on your property, you have some sort of water storage. And this had accomplished it for the people that lived along these water passages, which is gone. And that is concerning to them. It is concerning to me. And I'm presenting it to you so you're aware of what I have, have seen. So um, I look, I, I'm concerned because there's still more dams scheduled to be removed. And there is a, a list, I think, of 39 pages of 
dam removal projects. And I know Savage Rapids and um, Gold Ray were in the top ten. And once they were removed, Weimer and Fielder Dam were moved up into that position. And I've heard um, discussion and dialogue of Applegate Dam is uh, scheduled to be removed. In fact, our Senator, Bert Sugar, is quoted in this article in the Mail Tribune, and that it talks about his view of Applegate Dam being successful in its salmon um, ladders, and they're able to jump, and the importance of saving that. And I have even heard, and I found an article um, through Water Watch that says, and um, I know they, um, our experts talked about the importance of Lost Creek Dam being a storage facility. And I want to read this article um, from 2012 out of Water Watch. It's 2010, I'm sorry. A Portland, Oregon or organization known as Water Watch spearheaded campaigns to remove Savage Rapids Dam, it's done, Gold Ray Dam, it's gone, Gold Hill Dam, Elk Creek Dam, it's gone, and Lost Creek Dam from the Rogue River. And I just wanted, I just hope we as a, as a commission board are aware of this, and I, and I want to stand unified against this kind of action. If there's anything we can do to save that, I think our, it, we do owe it to our county and we owe it to the citizens that um, are served by that water storage. And that is a concern for me. One of the, one of the recipients that the uh, Laura Onan sent her response of my conversation to was a person named Raquel Rancier. And she wrote an article in November of 2012, and it's called Case Studies in In Integrated Water Re Resource Management. And um, it states in her article on page 11 in your book, coordination is required for integration of, of the water program. And I know even John Roberts uh, mentioned coordinating. And I know it's not a FLIPMA thing, but it says integrate water management between and within levels of government and other organizations with recognition of the respective roles of each. And it talks about monitoring and um, in part of the implementation as well. And I don't know that I see that happening. I appreciate uh, Mr. Roberts coming and talking to us about the place-based planning and if that's the attempt for coordination, I think it would, I hope we have a seat at that table in what's going on with our water. Um, there's more information on in the following pages that talk about the UN Water Task Force and Integrated Water Resource Management Team and anything with the UN Agenda 21 is, and that's from his uh, 2012 article. There's just highlighted parts, and that also has a copy of the Water Watch's um, campaign to remove uh, also Boss Creek Dam from the Rogue River in there. So on the next page, which is 12 on your book, I have a lot of material to get together. Oregon Water Resources <coughs> Department, it's to um, Oregon.gov, it's a biennial report. And it talks about the Rogue River Basin, and, and there's a section called dam removal. And it says the department worked with multiple partners to facilitate dam removal on the Rogue River. Partners include Water Watch, NOAA, there's all kinds of acronyms, <laughs> and National, I don't know, Marine Fisheries Board, or ODFW, BLM, Jackson County, River Design Group, American Rivers, Geos Institute, and several irrigation districts. These entities work together on the 2014 Gold Hill Irrigation District Diversion Dam Removal, as well as the Fielder and Weimer Dam Removal scheduled for 2015. So my question, did, did coordination already occur before we, before we got here? It sure didn't occur since I've been here. But we are listed as a partner on that. So moving on, last week we heard from the DEQ on the TMDL and the total maximum daily load, and it's the Clean Water Act, it's the law. And when you look at these pictures from the Weimar Dam and the turbidity, and I just would wonder how much was released when that was released. And that's certainly not my area of expertise uh, to monitor or measure that. I know the Senator Bertschurter, that was one of his concerns when he was on site, and he told me, he said, they never intended to measure anything, and he was a little disappointed. 
And following on, there, these are just further pictures of the Weimar Dam removal. And in regards to a riparian area, and I hear of all that, and when it comes to citizens, you look at what the destruction of the trees, and they're plundered, and they're piled, and it's totally destroyed around that dam area. And you see, when I know citizens like Jeff and Debbie Sterling, who, who were fined by moving, removing a tree near a creek, or Mr. Broadsham, or whatever his name was, up by Shady Cove, who tried to improve his property, and yet non-government organizations can create an area that looks like this uh, without the oversight of uh, the same, same rules and laws that affect private citizens trying to do things on their private property. But I just wanted to, to know basically um, your guys' view on the dam removal and looking at Lost Creek what they possibly being uh, in line for that and what do you want to do as a board of commissioners. I, I refuse to turn a blind eye to it. I just think we need to know what's going on and why and I appreciate John Roberts' input in what they're doing um, with the integrated strategies and how we can be involved in that to protect what we have left. Well, I appreciate it. Can, can I just answer some of the questions that were asked as, as the fact before you guys talk politically about it? There were some statements and questions that were proposed. First of all, the Applegate Dam is not scheduled for removal. Um, it, it may be a political desire of Water Watch to have it removed, but it's not scheduled for removal. It's not going through a removal process. There's no agency applications for removal. Um, with regards to the, the permitting agencies specify the amount of turbidity allowed in the dam project. We know this from our own uh, project with Gulfway Dam. They set the standard for monitoring what, whether it's required or not and what amount of turbidity can be affected by it. in water work. It doesn't even matter if it's a dam or whatever you're doing in the waterway. Uh, coordination was mentioned as it applies here. It's not as in terms of the federal coordination requirement or FLIPMA, it's the standard meaning of coordinating with someone to accomplish something. So it doesn't apply here whatsoever, or FLIPMA is a uh, concern. However, cooperation is uh, applicable under the federal legal meaning of NEPA with regard to any project that would require an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement. So um, in this case of the two dams that were mentioned to begin with, uh, those receive what's called a categorical exclusion, which essentially means they don't go through an EA or EIS. That does constitute the EA or EIS. And then with regard to repair areas, just so everyone's aware, uh, any project doesn't just allow for the removal of vegetation within a repair area. It requires for the removal, but also mitigation. So the dam being removed doesn't constitute the dam project being completed. There will be mitigation requirements of the impacts from that repairing area, not unlike the Sterlings are required to do, since they were mentioned, to mitigate the impact they have in the repairing area. So they get with DEQ, and DEQ says, okay, you have these impacts, you need to mitigate that, here's what you need to do. The same thing happens with the dam removal, you're required to mitigate it. In other words, make up for the damage that you caused within the repairing area. So those were just ones that I caught to write down question. In fact, and, you know, I'm not arguing whether it's good or bad, but those are just the answers to the questions uh, that are posed. And um, if you have any specific questions, I know with regard to actions on the water resource department that Mr. Monteiro or Travis would certainly be willing to address those. Yeah, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, Larry or Travis. Um, the removal of these two uh, reservoirs that Commissioner Roberts has just mentioned, uh, I, they're dams, I should she call them dams, and mm -hmm. let's do respect to that way. Uh, does it have any impact to the water rights of the individuals? in that area. Well, it wasn't, though. Danny mentioned mitigation. Um, I want to clarify something. These were not publicly owned dams. These were privately owned dams. And Water Watch worked with, Water Watch worked with the landowners to gain their permission via contracts. Um, so when it comes to public interest, these were privately owned. They allowed the facilities to, and contractors to go in and do these dams. They had multiple opportunities to protest, to, to try to stop the project. Uh, originally, these dams were scheduled to go out in the 90s, um, and the landowners changed their mind, and the projects were stopped. 
and they, and they had funding. Um, Water Watch took it one step further and basically was going to go into a lawsuit with the landowner. The landowner just decided to settle and agree to remove these dams. One of the mitigations for the pump site that Ms. Roberts talks about is addition in there that they would will rebuild the structure to where she will have her pump facility. The pictures are deceiving. Look in the crowd. Evans Creek has the least amount of water it's had in it in 50 years. That actually compounded some of the sediment issues because there wasn't any water at all to flush the sediments when they were originally going to kick them out. We wanted as low flow as possible so we wouldn't have a huge plume, but we wanted some water to help move some of this. So they actually removed some of the sediment when the intent was for it to gradually dissipate. I think if once high flows go through when these projects have gone and been taken out, give it a year and go back and look, and it won't look as devastating as it does two days after we remove it, or however long this picture is on. Um, they are dams, but they, are, they were not designed to store water. They were designed to divert yeah, the dams, one of the dams was 12 and a half feet high. Lost big reservoirs on the feet, Travis. 360 very, very tall. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I'm not here to argue one way or the other. Our agency's role in this was to assist the other agencies and Water Watch to provide them with water right information. Those who would be impacted from this. Uh, it's my understanding that the project had money put aside for folks that would be impacted, proven impacts. In other words, if your intakes were affected by the project, they would go in and fix those intakes like they're going to do for the one landowner at Weimar Dam is rebuild the pump hole. It's kind of hard to rebuild the pump hole when there's no water in the creek. Okay, so yes, the dam backed it up for that one pump, but once the dam was removed, I just see what truly the creek was providing at that time. Um, so there is mitigation for all the folks that have a legitimate impact from the project. And so prior to the dams being removed, the studies that were made identified those folks upstream or downstream within a certain reach that may be impacted. There's money put aside to help those folks extend their intakes, provide fish screens, whatever they need. Again, that's not my agency's responsibility. That's Water Watch and, and Brian Barr's organization that was the lead contract or lead uh, project manager. Um, and you are subject, I mean, kind of the Commissioner Roberts brought up that the government can do what the private individuals can. The government's actually subject to the exact same consequences as the private individuals. So there's, no, there's no difference in treatment. For example, if we didn't meet our mitigation plan, we can we can suffer penalties and civil actions just like a private landowner can. Um, and we were required to provide mitigation in the repairing area. Um, and we were required to actually create structures from the Bear Creek confluence to uh, further uh, deter any erosion of that confluence back up the confluence. So we were required to actually build structures. They were natural structures, you know, posting and barriers to mitigate multiple impacts that the removal of the dam caused. Whether you're a private citizen or a public, you know, public agency, the same rules apply. NEPA applies. Whether you can get a categorical exclusion or not, I mean, I, to be honest with you, when we did our project, I would have loved if we could have got a categorical exclusion. But obviously, gold rain is much more of an impact than the builder of Weimar Dam in terms of removal. So um, there is no difference in treatment in terms of what we have to do. In terms of coordinating, as I mentioned, it wasn't a an issue of federal coordination under FLIP, but it's an issue of working with someone to accomplish something. They, they did, and they work with the county, they work with, you know, Oregon Water Resources Department works with all you know, the Watershed Council, for example, which comes and reports to the board that's working with the county. And they work for our planning department to acquire the proper permits for work in a flood plain. There is this misnomer that the county uh, approved the dam removal. The county didn't approve the dam removal. We don't approve dam removals. What we approve is you can work in the floodplain for the permit you receive from a federal regulatory agency to remove the dam. So we don't, 
We don't say whether you can remove the dam or not. We say that you can work in the floodplain or not. We do that because of your ordinance. That's also coordinating with you via your, your ordinance, which says, with regard to dam removal, if you're working, uh, if you're going to divert the course of the river and or working on a fish enhancement project, this is what's in your ordinance, then you have to come and get a floodplain permit for that. So there are multiple levels where both of those projects and any dam removal project does co coordinate, not only the flip in terms of coordination, but in terms of working through county processes and county agencies that advise you. Uh, you know, the Gold Ray Dam uh, removal project came before your MRAC because the board wanted MRAC's input on it. So that's also working with you. Even if it doesn't come directly to the board, it's still working with the county because those particular groups represent the county's interests. Uh, so those were some of the more uh, other comments that you brought up. Similar to uh, the process of the um, place-based planning, where you're, you know, this is going to be a lot of work at the watershed council level, and I would would suggest at the county's level that you know the board refer if you choose to support that project, that process, that you have your impact involved in that process as well. They work closely with your water the watershed councils in the past. Uh, then it will involve potentially, you know, our, our planning department if does any activity that goes along with construction or deconstruction of any particular uh, capital uh, investment is going to have to go through that process from the county too. It may include uh, cooperation under the legal status of cooperation with NEPA, not you and I are cooperating to get something done, but rather you're required to go through this process under NEPA if there's an EI, a, or environmental assessment or EIS required. Which any project, the, the question you had about uh, will there be imminent domain? Mm -hmm. Any project that would be construction of a dam that would create off channel backwater will require an EA or an EIS. And what that will require then is anyone who could be impacted, private citizens or government agencies, uh, have the opportunity uh, to have public comment. I will say that dam projects all over the United States, some of them are created on federal lands where if you don't have any some of them are created on a mix of federal and private lands, lands where you have internet, but you have access to internet domain. In most of those cases, people end up selling their property rather than going through the internet domain process. Uh, but there are cases where internet domain is used. And when he said he couldn't answer your question, it really would depend on the project. But it could be used. I want you to know that it, it, it is a process that it could be used for sure. Like Applegate Lake, the creation of that kind of What? The kind of copper is underneath Applegate Lake. Yeah. Well, and speaking of Applegate, because um, <coughs> Mr. Jordan said that Applegate Dam was not scheduled to remove on, and in 2015, there's a 39-page list of dam removals, and it is the Murphy Dam on the Applegate River is on this list um, um, from the statewide fish passage priority list. So. Yeah, yeah. Could you go ahead and yeah. Murphy yeah. touch on that? Also, I'd like you to touch on Commissioner Roberts' had concern on Lost Creek. Also, to the other um, document that she cited in her package. Mm -hmm. Could you touch on Lost Creek and stuff? To my knowledge, again, to my knowledge, it could be on the list, <coughs> but there's no there's no project out there. There's no talk about removal of Lost Creek. Lost Creek, the amount of water that it is storing right now, is allowing. Well, let, let, let me just clarify something. So, there is talk of removal of Lost Creek by an environmental group that has an agenda to do it. But when I said it's not scheduled for removal, what I'm saying is there's been no action, no date set, no federal action that would provide for the permitting. It may be on a list that someone would like to have it removed, but that's different than being scheduled for removal. So all I'm saying is the dam's not being removed. It's not scheduled for removal. There are certainly people that would probably like to see it removed and Lost Creek Dam removed but none of the agencies that regulate that have a process that, with regard to those two specific dams, and I was mentioning Applegate because it was stated that it's scheduled for removal. It's, there's, there's no date that the dam is scheduled. And that's what I was addressing. No date, no agency support. It, 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 it may be a wish list, but it's not. And it might be an assumption on my part. I think there's any other, but if this came over, we would recognize the importance of those two dams. It was I can yeah. tell you that, what, you know, depending on who the controlling agency is, uh, at a previous meeting, Mr. Roberts asked about introduction to the DEQ meeting. 
actually asked about introduction of flow from Lost Creek and do we get credit for that in terms of meeting our TEM model. We don't regulate that, the federal government does. And so, and, and I'll, this is my personal experience, I was here when we went through it. You know, we, we went so far as filing an injunction at the county level to try to defeat the notching of Elk Creek Dam. We took very significant legal action, but because it's a federally managed project, or a federally owned project, and a federally ran project, what we did didn't, had no bearing. They went out and notched the dam two days later. So there are some of these dams, Lost Creek being one of them, who's managed by the Army Corps, that the same thing could happen. And, you know, I'm not saying that you can't oppose that, but you know, it's not regulated at the local or state level. It's regulated by the federal government. So that's a whole, you know, even prior to that, several, almost a decade prior to the notching of Elk Creek Dam, uh, Congressman Smith, Bob Smith, held congressional hearings here because the Army Corps was talking about removing or notching the dam. So we had a congressman who stood up for us, but the fact that the commissioner who were doing it didn't have a bearing on the result was the fact that a congressman did it because it was federally managed and federally, and he was successful in blocking through the congressional inquiry here locally. Uh, we didn't get that same treatment. He was no longer in office when, we went, when, when they said they were going to notch the dam. And the process by which they did it, when he did the congressional inquiry, was a congressional action authorizing it or not. In the actual notching of the dam, it wasn't a congressional action that authorized it. The department just did it with budget authority, with which to us was wrong. And the board stood against it. I do want you all to know, since I've been here, nine years and been through multiple, you know, we removed Gold Ray Dam and we fought the removal of you know, the notching of Elk Creek Dam and we dealt, we dealt in and out of dams. Each case where it's been a public, publicly owned, we, we haven't had a case where we've had private, in this case, filter and winery dams that are private, you know, held in private property uh, where the board has, has taken action because in the past, the, the fact that it's a private property right has superseded the board's political position on whether or not they agree with them. They defer to the fact this is private property and they have the right to do what they want. You may or may not do that, but that's been what's happened in the past. With regard to the to, to the other dams, generally our prior boards have been, you're the third board that I've worked for, but our prior boards have been generally opposed to dam removal. But that doesn't mean we didn't support you know the removal of Gold Ray Dam for the reasons the, the board did. And that was after an EA process. In fact, we've had hundreds of people show up to testify to the board, both in the public hearings, the county stage, and just at regular board of commissioner meetings every week. And so they took a ton of input. Discretionary decision, uh, and they made it and stated why, and that's why it was upheld. That's why no one was able to. But I wanted you to know, because you're now in the seat of where prior boards have said, is generally the boards have opposed and they haven't been involved in private property right issues, whether it be dam removal or whatever, in terms of trying to intervene on someone's personal action on a private property. But with regard to any federal dam, they've been opposed to it. That's our staff's direction from the prior boards. So that's that's what when we're when we're confronted by agencies about those types of things, we you know policies from boards carry forward unless you change the policy, because that's the direction that's given the staff. Is that you know so when we're when we're negotiating. For example, when we participate in WISE, or we participate in discussions about use of water with regard to our dams, or public facilities, not we're not involved with discussing Weimar or Fielder Dam, they're private property, but with regard to other public facilities, our, our staff carry forward the policy position of the board that we're generally opposed to removal of dams. So don't, you know, if, if that's the conversation we're going to have, here's where the county starts their position. So I just want you to know that because you may or may not have known that. I, I think we've had discussions to that effect, and I think that's been kind of verbalized on this board. That, that position is still, of course, being carried forward. Um, and then as far as anything in the future, I think, you know, full vetting, research, evaluation of what you know, the proposal might be, and then a position taken at that point um, is the way I, I feel we would always proceed. Uh, but as far as just the general position of the board, I, I, Again, I thought we've had a discussion, or at least alluded to it, and we expressed that that position is what we wanted to continue and carry forward with, that we do generally oppose um, dam removals. But I, of course, always want to retain the right to evaluate the, the, the 
specific situation. Um, it, and I appreciate the research you've done because that's part of that evaluation process and hopefully that's done and the information you get from any source, uh, but always to evaluate it on an individual basis. Uh, so you know, try to some conceptual. Let, let me say what I think is most important here. If, 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 you're, if the prior board's position stands general, the difference with this, with Commissioner uh, Roberts' request and the conversation you're having is these two privately held hands. So I want you to understand that typically I wouldn't direct staff to be involved at any level advocating or opposing the removal of someone's decision on what to do with their private property, however that decision came to be. Now, if you want us to do that, if you want us to use county resources, you can direct that. If that's, if you, and, and that's what the conversation in, in terms of staff, I mean, you have a political position, but your political positions derive, you know, our direct staff towards all the interactions we have on a daily basis in our parks department, our roads department, our uh, water resources, in our um, planning department. So we need to know that. Um, you know, this this issue, when I, when I when Commissioner Roberts, I think, was the first one who came talking about, I said, oh, well, those are private hands. We don't have anything to do with it besides we'll issue a floodplain permit. We also may have had the issue of permit for people to use the road, which wasn't because they were moving the dam or not, it was because they exceeded a certain weight for potentially the material that would be on the truck that would be traveling on our road. And, and I did explain that was also a potential that we may or may not permit. But it didn't matter whether it was you know, uh, concrete from the dam or uh, you know, some kind of weight that exceeded the, the limit. Um, and so that I didn't pursue it any further. Commissioner Roberts kept asking questions. People called. People showed up at your meeting. And you know, previously, the board would have said, look, this is a private property right issue. So the county isn't involved in this. And, and I wanted it for discussion of, of awareness, because I don't see it stopping at these two dams. And um, what, what is next on the environmentalist movement, um, I just wanted us to be aware and have an open discussion um, of what's going on under our watch in Jackson County. And um, I know they were privately owned, and whatever um, duress they were under or, or not to, to do this. I've also seen, and it's another situation, what happened on private property with Gary Harrington. He went to jail. So dam and water storage is, is a big political button in Jackson County for a variety of reasons. And, um, and I, I just wanted us to be aware of it as in our positions in Jackson County. And I would like to read, Craig Tuss has a, he's a fish biologist with RV Cog, which I serve as liaison to. And he said, and this is from 2012, removing dams is still something fairly new in the Pacific Northwest, and each one is different, said Craig Tuss, a fish biologist hired by RV Cog to oversee the project. It's losing an opportunity to gather information that could inform us about future dam removals. Most people assume that removing dams from rivers, such as the road, help restore their natural functions. But, and he quoted, but we're making a lot of assumptions about removing dams, Tuss said. It's good to have information to back up what your assumptions are. And I want information. So I wrote to the governor, and I, so I did the research at no cost to the county. That's why I made copies for anybody who wants a copy at no cost to the county. And uh, it's important. It's an important issue. And water with our drought is, and private property, I just see a lot of issues that, that are a concern. So I appreciate finally getting to talk about it because we can't talk privately. So you had, you had one other question on another dam on the outbreak. What was the name of the Murphy? I don't think Murphy that's in Jackson County. I think it's in Jackson County. It's, it's up by King Bridge. So no, it's the, yeah. the Murphy Dam. The Murphy Dam is by the town of Murphy. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, that again is a privately owned version dam. Right, that's right. Um, it says Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Fish and Wildlife on this sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, Fish and Game noticed that it was a, a span that goes completely across the river with no fish passage at all. Um, very old. Very similar to push up dams that they do along the river where they move the gravel beds up. This one just happens to have concrete boards, black disc screen, whatever they can do to block the storage to go down the Murphy ditch. So it's privately owned, very small and height structure. I also agree with the comment that every every project is going to be different. Um, I will say I, 
I do want you to know, you know, with regard to the old data, the county was required to go to an EIA or the e, uh, EA, EA or EIS process. And the county's purpose of moving the dam didn't have to do necessarily with the thought of fish patches would get better or not, or that it would be better for the environment or not. What it had to do was we were faced with investing somewhere between 12 and $20 million to rebuttress the dam that was failing and building correct fish passage or using $5 million to remove it. I mean, honestly, it came down to a financial decision. We had no money. At the time, we were deficit spending at the county $7 million a year just in our operating budget. We had no money. We would have went out and borrowed money to, to be able to do it. And we were being provided a grant to remove the dam. And so, it, honestly, it really came down to a financial decision whether we had the dam or not. Uh, and that may not be the case with this private property, you know, these people's private property. It may or may not be the case with another dam. You know, I think our board heard a lot about how it would affect people's property to remove the dam, their new sheds, and their irrigation, and all of those kinds of things. And we did attempt to mitigate all of that, but none of those people were willing to step up and provide 12 to $20 million to keep the dam. They just wanted to benefit from it. And so, you know, the, the argument about we're guessing at a lot of this stuff, we weren't guessing. We knew it would cost us 12 to $20 million bucks for. It, 12 to 20 million really depended on how we wanted to design get the lifespan out of it. And some things we didn't know, like how much effort we go into rebuttressing the dam. Like, well, we'd have to do divert the water bill and build a, another structure to divert the water off. And there's all sorts of variables. That's why it's such a span of cost. Uh, but it wasn't hard to get an estimate to remove the dam. And what was weird is even when we look at the estimate to remove the dam, once we removed the dam, we found out, oh, there's another dam. Oh, and there's another dam in front of that. There was all of this stuff that just happened as we went through the process. So, you know, there are cases, as I said, where our board agreed with removal of the dam. And in that case, it was a matter of fiduciary issues with being able to pay for it and, you know, what we could or couldn't pay for. I don't disagree that in that case, Water Watch was advocating for the removal of the dam for what they perceived to be uh, a fish enhancement and environmental reasons. But all of those things, when it came down to our board's decision, really came down to a financial decision. And I, will, I do want to announce the fact that um, September 3rd, the Army Corps of Engineers is having a discussion with the Shady Cove City Council about the collapse of the Lost Creek Dam. And I don't know if it's from natural causes or under Water Watch's authority, but I will go to that meeting and discover what the purpose of, of this uh, public meeting will be. I just want to uh, distort you all know, my personal thoughts on you know, the dams are important. Right? We have storage and we have the version that's actually used for agricultural purposes. I think they're important to maintain that infrastructure that we have and not lose it. But there are times when uh, maintaining that infrastructure and then replacing that infrastructure, those decisions have to be made. And sometimes taking something out and put something in that has more potential in the long run is controversial sometimes, but at the same time has a larger long-term impact on the agricultural uh, portion of our economy and our community, and will actually provide more water in the long term. And, and as it comes to prop private property rights, I have never believe that this board should be involved in any way with private property rights and the infringement on those private property rights. Uh, in this, these two cases, I, I see these as a, a decision of those landowners, and they were privately held, privately owned, and they made those decisions. Uh, the government to intrude on that to me would be uh, not, not well received. And then it has to be yeah. just awareness. I understand. I understand. And, but I don't, and if, if you look at dam removals in the future, for those that are privately owned, I don't think it would be it, just telling people what they can and can't do on their private property is one of the things that I believe is that we should stay away from. You know, to minimize that and have as much as possible on private property. So if someone owns a dam and they say, I want this out, then it's their, their private property. So I think it's the same as if they want to grow wheat or if they want to grow hay or if they want to run a tractor to do it versus do it with horses. It's their prerogative. So I see that as a, a fine line sometimes between the of private property 